Hello and welcome to Atop the Fourth Wall, where bad comics burn. And the final episode of Event Comics Month 4, Secret Metal Armageddon 2! Every time we do Event Comics Month, there's always a clear winner. Something that everyone wants me to cover above all the others, and this year it was Dark Knight's Metal. It's a pretty damn popular event, not just with fans of this show, but DC fans overall. And boy is this gonna be a disappointing episode for people, because I don't actually like this event very much. I do not hate it, I wouldn't even say it's bad, it is most certainly a palate cleanser after the last few, but I don't think it's that great. I think it's a fairly confusing book that continues several retcons that I'm not fond of and introduces a plethora of new ones I don't like either. But that's just a case of, eh, it doesn't work for me, but I see why others would like it. Hilariously, the sequel to this event also got a good chunk of votes, and how weird would it be if people had me cover the sequel to a book before the first? It... Yeah, well... Stop pointing out my own hypocrisy, damn it! Anyway, Dark Knight's Metal. I have praised Scott Snyder's Batman run in the past, particularly its early days with Gates of Gotham and the Court of Owls storylines. And that praise holds! They're still good stories, but as time went on, I think Snyder's work took a bit of a downturn as he tried to leave a larger mark on Batman history. It felt like he was trying to create stories that would become as iconic and memorable and as well-remembered in history as others. Death in the Family, Dark Knight Returns, Year One, etc. Except in this case, he was putting his own spin on those stories... And not as good, because we'd already done them. And let me be clear, they are not bad... They're just not as interesting as they think they are. Like, especially with Death of the Family and Endgame, they propagated the stupid Joker is ten steps ahead of everyone at any given time thing. There are huge disasters plaguing Gotham for like the 50th time that year. It's just not as engaging as it thinks it is. Still, Snyder's work during this time highlighted one of his great strengths, turning Gotham City and its history into its own character. Lore about the town and its architecture that made everything that much cooler and more interesting to be there. But then he went a step further to introduce a bunch of retcons about the Waynes, the Pennyworths, the Graysons, etc. Like, this kind of started with Grant Morrison during his Batman run a few years earlier. This implication that just from a cosmic, destiny, supernatural kind of thing about the universe, Bruce Wayne was always destined to be Batman. That Bats played a part in his family history, and said history just contained so many interesting and heroic and over-the-top figures, and none of them were just, like... A dude, or some random woman who did nothing that noteworthy in history other than be a regular person. And that kind of carried over into Snyder's run where suddenly there were conspiracies around Dick Grayson, Bruce Wayne's family, etc, etc. I bring this up because... It's a lot, and his run was still widely popular by the time we got to Dark Knight's Metal, which he described as the culmination of his Batman run up until that point. And you could have fooled me because I didn't even realize there was supposed to be a culmination. And you know what? It's not really. There are certainly a few references peppered in about his run in this, but said references are in turn kind of confusing if you weren't reading it. Or in my case, only half remembering them because it had been a few years since the stuff he was bringing up. This is not helped by the fact that, much like Heroes in Crisis, this was coming out post-DC Rebirth, where what was and was not in continuity anymore was in flux. Doomsday Clock, which would kinda sorta restore the pre-New 52 universe, was coming out a few months later, and it felt like elements of the New 52 were being ignored for the sake of this story, which is certainly something we'll be addressing later. But let's talk about the event overall. Scott Snyder said that the central concept of this miniseries was inspired by the idea of dark matter. Put simply, dark matter is a theoretical concept built around the fact that by existing scientific principles, the universe should have more mass than it actually does. Thus, dark matter. This special kind of matter that normally we can't interact with for various reasons. 
seasons. Thus, what if the DC multiverse, which consisted of 52 parallel universes and the antimatter universe, had another layer to them? A dark multiverse that consisted of the universes where everything went wrong, our worst fears realized, waking nightmares. Which sounds really interesting and ripe for story potential, but fails a lot in execution, in my opinion. We'll get to it later. The trade paperback introduction to Metal has Snyder talking about how much he loved event comics as a kid, how much he still adores them. And I've had to rewrite the intro to this damn episode four times now, because each time it devolves into a lengthy rant about events and how much I have grown to despise them over the course of Event Comics Month 4. All my cynicism about this industry just kind of boiling over. And I need to stop myself for two reasons. One, because this episode is so damn long already, and we need to just talk about the comic. And two, you all know why events suck so much. There are certainly good ones. I've reviewed them. I've extolled their virtues. But I've also spent just as much time talking about all the garbage ones, and this event comics month has been full of them. So let's just dig into Dark Knight's Metal and try to have some fun with this. <laughs> Before we get into the story, we have to talk about a couple things. One, while we're not going to talk about the individual covers, this event does have something kind of unique going for it. Because 90s nostalgia was in, we brought back chrome foil covers for this event. Dude! Except I am actually kind of in favor of this because, hey, the comic is literally called metal and metallic substances are a major plot point. Making the cover shiny is actually kind of a neat gimmick, and I won't begrudge its inclusion here. But two, this event also has a minor thing right out of the gate, continually annoying me because I keep misspelling it as Dark Knights with a K because, you know, Batman. It is not, as you can see. It is Knights with an N. Which in turn just confuses me, because why isn't it Knights with a K, given the plot of this thing? We open 50,000 years ago as a lizard walks across a desert. Lost to history is a story. However, it was another live-action remake of a Disney animated film, so nobody cared. A story about how, in these lands, during the Age of Stone, there were three great tribes of man. Tribe of the Wolf, of the Bear, and of the Bird. Gerrymandering to support one tribe over another, though, was still pretty common. All were nomadic and shared a grand dream. A dream of discovery. That dream was shattered when they actually watched it, and they just hoped that strange new worlds would be better. But soon, a fourth tribe arose. A tribe called Quest. A dark tribe, unlike the others. One of twisted dreams. Dreams turned inside out. And with its terrible rise, so began the age of metal. And soon, so did come new metal. And there was much debate about what new metal actually was and what bands qualified for it. And thus we enter the bizarre beginning of this event, where without context, the Justice League is in the middle of some arena controlled by Mongol so they can fight in gladiatorial combat to the death, and Mongol has forced them into armor that's inhibiting their powers and strengths. As far as I know, there is no lead-up to this, not even a tie-in that explains how the hell they got into this situation. And what's worse is that this isn't even actually important to the event. I suppose you could argue it's foreshadowing, or thematically appropriate, or just meant to be a fun, cool, goofy moment. 
but I think it's mostly pointless. The League fights robots that Mongol forced the child version of the Toy Man to build, but Toy Man hit a special way for the League to go inside of the robots and form them into a friggin' Voltron-style giant robot. Ha! It worked! Alfred, call Billy from the Power Rangers and tell them I was totally able to do it! Were you able to create the flying Volkswagen Beetle as well, sir? Yes, yes, I, I was totally able to make that work. It's just, uh, it's in the shop right now. Alfred, have it ready for me when I get back to the cave. Wait, why do I have to be the foot? I mean, you got it better than Green Lantern, who ended up being the crotch. Mongol was supposed to be held prisoner by some aliens, but before they can go investigate that, the actual plot of the story starts knocking and Alfred calls up Batman, informing him that a friggin' mountain has appeared right in the middle of Gotham City. They don't mention casualties, but they do mention that the city seemed to start expanding to make room for this thing. Oh, uh, don't worry guys, it was just the dividing driver from Gaugaigar, no worries. Although there probably should be some seizure warnings. There were two prequel comics that led into this, but I'm not including them here, partially because they're not included in the trade. Even Superman Beyond 3D got put into Final Crisis's collection. So I wouldn't call them essential, but they have made references to them in this. In this case, Green Lantern mentioning the energy he detects. It's like what I felt from your machine in the cave. Hell, that was my coffee maker! The Flash soon discovers a doorway with a particular symbol on it. That of the Challengers of the Unknown. Never really talked about them before, but the Challengers are science heroes. You know, not exactly superheroes, but they're all about studying weird scientific stuff. Had their heyday in the Silver Age, but they pop up on occasion in DC, usually during big events. And this is where we're starting to get into that head tilting with the continuity here. Because they actually did reintroduce the Challengers of the Unknown already in the New 52. But here they're pretending like they have no idea who these people are. Once inside, they've also got an unconscious Red Tornado android in the lab with them, though it looks like in his case, they've only hinted at him and they didn't fully revive him post-New 52 yet. Anyway, the place is weird, with anachronistic technology, yet advanced designs, energy they can't pin down, and most importantly, a cryogenic chamber with several people inside. Superman wants to revive them, but Batman thinks that's unwise until they know what they're dealing with. This is not helped by a message written in what is presumably blood on the side of the pod. It's chasing us. Run. Well, now how the hell are we supposed to follow that advice when you're not even running, guys? You literally went to sleep instead. A group of people walk out, a modern version of the Blackhawks that was introduced into the New 52 in a short-lived series. They tell the heroes to step away from the pod. She's called Lady Blackhawk. She runs the Blackhawks, some kind of damn covert anti-apocalypse team. They've been watching me. I've been watching them. Learning their secrets. Now I too know the 11 herbs and spices of Blackhawk Chicken. A caption informs us that this was all told in the pages of All-Star Batman. For those who I'm sure are already confused, yes, Scott Snyder ended up writing his own All-Star Batman book completely unrelated to Frank Miller's Aspar. It's why I'm 99% confident we'll never see that book concluded. They already took the name to give it to a much better series. Well, I say that, but I only read the first couple issues or so. It was fine, but nothing I was that into. Still, I've got to imagine it was better than Asbar. I don't recall any scenes of Batman telling kids to eat rats. Lady Blackhawk takes off her mask and reveals herself as Kendra Saunders, a.k.a. Hawkgirl. Her own reintroduction post-New 52, though not assuming the heroic identity here. She explains that this place, aka Challenger's Mountain, being teleported here like this is the first shot of a full-scale invasion. She brings them to Blackhawk Island to explain further. There are places on this planet that lie outside of the normal math of things. Some exist at what we believe are phantom frequencies. Spots where cosmic energy conducted through the Earth's metal core cancels itself out, creates a kind of static that disrupts space-time, a hidden pocket. Some are magic-induced, some are naturally occurring. Dinosaur Island, Themyscira, Scartarus, Nanda Parbat, Cleveland. And indeed, Black Hawk Island is also like that. Kendra explains that the island also served as the base of operations for another hero. Carter Hall, a.k.a. Hawkman. So, like, in the midst of Rebirth and Doomsday Clock and even the New 52 stuff, 
Did everyone just forget that Carter Hall exists? Did we have another soft reboot at some point that pretended Hawkman isn't still in the universe, even though he had a book in the New 52? Apparently so. I had to look this up, and it seems that in the New 52, Carter Hall just became a pseudonym for Qatar Hall of Thanagar again. But there was still a Hawkman running around post-New 52, Yet nobody mentions him here and act as if this is the first time Hawkman has ever been a thing. So thanks, New 52, for once again overcomplicating Hawkman. Nothing ever changes. They reboot and just do the same things over and over again, but worse. Why even bother with a reboot if you're not going to actually change anything? I'll see you in a few years when all the Hawkman and Hawkgirl, for some reason, all get merged into the same person again, like in Zero Hour. She explains Hawkman's deal of reincarnating for thousands of years alongside her, said reincarnation being bestowed upon them thanks to being stabbed by a dagger made of a material called Nth Metal. Now, I don't know if the New 52 had properly introduced Nth Metal into that Hawkman series, but again, she's explaining Nth Metal, a powerful substance used by the Thanagarians, as if this is the first time they've ever encountered it. But yeah, Nth Metal's a pretty spiffy material, granting superpowers to those who utilize it. Flight, immortality, mystical vision, etc. It also apparently broadcasts a strange kind of energy, the same kind they detected in the mountain. However, Carter Hall, while investigating the Nth Metal, discovered that it may have originated far beyond what they know of as the multiverse, and in turn that there was a warning about it, that it came from evil and would lead to evil, though Carter rejected that idea. He in turn recruited people to help in searching out more about the stuff, including the Will Payton Starman here, I guess? Weird reference, but okay. But yeah, that also included the Challengers of the Unknown, and they all decided to go to the source of the Nth Metal. This is a map of what we believe to be our multiverse. As you can see, we are here, and we're going to install an Orange Julius on Earth-39. The map actually stems from Grant Morrison's Multiversity series, but it's more of a visual aid here. Kendra says that the Nth Metal can't be traced back to any known universe in the multiverse, and thus she suggests someplace else turning the map around. A dark multiverse. We were gonna call it the Upside Down, but then Stranger Things trademarked it first. All I see is the back of a map. Diana, you didn't literally think that the map of the multiverse was the multiverse, did you? Kendra says that the building blocks of reality include not just matter and antimatter, but dark matter and dark energy. That Nth Metal connects the regular multiverse to the dark multiverse. An oceanic, subconscious realm our tiny multiverse floats on. I'm gonna assume Snyder used the wrong word there, because subconscious would suggest a living mind, not just a realm of smaller universes operating differently than their own. If this is true, it would change everything we know about everything. So, this is one of the big issues I have with metal and a lot of DC cosmic stuff post not only the New 52, but post Rebirth as well. It overcomplicates the multiverse! This started in the New 52, where suddenly the Anti Monitor wasn't what we thought he was, just the first living being from the antimatter universe who wanted to destroy positive matter universes. No, no, no. He was Mobius, some ancient being who had a grudge against Darkseid and whom Metron's chair used to belong to, hence Mobius chair. I think that was originally done to recenter Darkseid as the biggest bad of the DCU, a decision I do not really like, but that's a discussion for another day. But yeah, suddenly we have this backstory that doesn't match what we know about the anti monitor that didn't need to happen. You could have just not mentioned him at all. But then this comic and future stories decided to try to reintroduce his proper backstory while keeping the stupid Mobius retcon, but not to restore the anti-monitor as the most powerful enemy of the DCU, instead to add a whole bunch of other new beings more powerful than him, including his mom, Perpetua. Oh, and it's later explained in Metal that it wasn't just the Monitor and Anti-Monitor anymore, there was also a third being, the World Forger, and multiple multiverses make up an Omniverse, and the purpose of the Monitor was to watch over worlds created by the World Forger until the end of time, and then the Anti-Monitor would destroy them, but Perpetua had some scheme to overthrow the beings more powerful than her, but her actions ended up pissing off the Anti-Monitor and- ah! What the hell 
what was wrong with just having some asshole from another universe who wanted to kill us all? How is this an improvement over that? It's just lore. Long, overcomplicated, tedious lore. Who was asking for that? Who thought it was a good idea? Why are we taking simple, easy to understand concepts and trying to shove in so many more things in them? Confession time. Around 2018, 2019 or so, I had actually stopped reading comics for a bit. There were a number of factors, being farther away from local comic shops than I used to be, creative team changes leading to books being less interesting, what happened to the Titans, again. But in my efforts to get back into regular reading, there's a Batgirls book starring Cassandra Cain and Stephanie Brown at the time of this release, just FYI, I had to learn about all this stuff. See, I got maybe two or three issues into metal in 2017 and then just didn't care about it and stopped reading it, so I didn't get to those revelations they put in later. So I'm reading this stuff on wikias, and like every five seconds I loudly declared, what, at each new revelation about the multiverse that they added in, particularly all the stuff leading into Metal's sequel, Death Metal. DC Rebirth felt like a breath of fresh air. I could recommend a dozen titles for new readers to check out, but nowadays, they've apparently just thrown up their hands and decided, well, if we're not going to get new readers, we'll just add new bits to the stuff everyone's already supposed to know about. Who cares if it's complicated? If they stuck with us through Heroes in Crisis, nothing we can do will make existing fans leave. This may seem like a bit of a tangent from the metal review itself, but that's just because I feel like this is where it started. I was so lost and confused reading the first issue of Metal when it first came out. I'm better with it now, but even then, it feels like a lot of this is an unnecessary exposition dump to try to take fairly simple concepts that already existed and make them so overly detailed and full of lore that it's harder to follow what and why things are happening. Anyway, Carter Hall's attempt to dive into the Dark Multiverse did not end well. Challenger's Mountain vanished entirely, and the last transmission from them was... not encouraging. The last transmissions we got from them were screams. Screams about whole worlds of nightmare, of evil. Please to shut the door and never open it again. In fact, I think we've got a copy of that transmission. Hey, Janet, can you play that back for us? I want you to remember that description of it. Worlds of nightmare, of evil. It's important for a thing later. Anyway, Red Tornado also sent a warning that there was a thing in the dark multiverse that could destroy everything. I found many names for it in history. A dark-horned god of nightmare, of cursed stories. I see it hidden in other deities. Set, Lord of the Rabasu, all prayed to through metals by the dark tribe, enemy of the birds. Of course. The tribe of coat hangers. <coughs> this creature's name was Barbados, and it wants to come to our universe and stir up some trouble. To do so, there's a gateway that's created, but the ritual requires a person treated with five divine metals that don't exist on the periodic table. A hero whose nightmares it collects as its army. Okay, I take it back. They might literally mean subconscious, meaning that the dark multiverse is made of Thoughts? Which is like, no. It's like, it's like trying to give a mystical explanation for something that wasn't in any way fantasy before. Anyway, point is that based on the study of the ancient scrolls about Barbados, the person who will open the portal has the name of Wayne, meaning Batman will be the one to let Barbados in. Hang on, your theory is that a being as old as the universe has been targeting Batman for thousands of years from a dark multiverse. I honestly can't pick which of my frequently used reference clips to use here for something so ludicrously silly, so... Screw it, I'm just gonna play them all. See, this is what I mean about overcomplicated lore and having so much importance in the universe placed on frickin' Batman. Just like, what? Why? What? What? Who thought, what? Ugh. Please tell me this isn't what you've been investigating. Okay, yes, but in my defense, I'm pretty sure Barbados is one face.
Kendra says that there's no way it's just a coincidence the Challenger Mountain reappears in Batman City, even pulling guns on him. She's also on board with the Nth Metal is Evil thing, but before they can do anything else, Red Tornado suddenly reactivates and attacks the group. Batman escapes with the scrap of Nth Metal Kendra had by riding a dinosaur. How weird is it that this is how we can connect this event to Secret Invasion? Batman manages to get all the way back to the Batcave. He's studying the Nth Metal Fragment because it's pure Nth Metal, unlike any other samples he's had before. He's trying to protect the League by not involving them in this, for stupid reasons, because it's the friggin' Justice League for crying out loud. But his study is interrupted by a humming sound, similar to that of a tuning fork. This is connected to another bit from the lead in comics, but I'll save that reveal again for later, because I think narratively it works better to have it here. Batman follows the humming upstairs to the manor, where in a study, a bat-shaped hole is burnt into the floor. Revealed underneath it is the journal of Carter Hall. Said journal has been narrating to us for a bit now, Carter stating that he left the journal in the care of the Waynes, who descend all the way back to that fourth tribe of man. The Bats. You see what I mean about all this unnecessary backstory and baggage now added? That it's his destiny to be associated with Bats because his entire family lineage traces back to it? Remember when he was just a dude who dressed up like a bat to scare criminals? Seems like that's a little easier for people to parse than latest descendant in a long line of people who were preparing for a war against a dark demon god from another dimension and he just happens to dress like a bat. Batman starts reading from the journal. And here's where a lot of people who are not familiar with this event probably are gonna be like me, tilt your head and go, what? Because who should show up when Batman realizes the legends about Barbados and his part in all this are true, but Daniel from Neil Gaiman's Sandman, AKA Dream of the Endless. Yes, that one. Now a few things to note with this. One, Snyder says that he did get permission from Neil Gaiman to do this, even though he technically didn't need to. This stuff is still all owned by DC, so class act from both sides here for asking for and getting permission. Two, it's not like this is the first time Daniel or any of the Endless have appeared in the DCU since the end of Sandman. Notably, Lex Luthor has met Death, and the characters Hector and Lita Hall were taken into the Dreaming by Daniel as part of the end of the JSA book at the time in the lead-up to Infinite Crisis. But those were really just brief cameos that kinda sorta made sense. Especially in the case of Lita Hall, given she was also a character in Sandman, she just started off as a DC character first. Three. There's something about his presence here. It's not offensive or anything. It's not like he does anything that's unbelievable, aside from just being here at all. It just feels like it cheapens him to play a role, even a small one like this, in a company-wide crossover event. Much like the inclusion of Watchmen stuff in the DC Universe, having Sandman stuff be more common in DC books, particularly ones like this, just makes them yet another part of DC's never-ending canon and constant reboots and stuff. No different than when some obscure DC hero shows up. Like, what makes this so special compared to any other crossover event? Anyway, let's move into issue two. The Justice League have organized as many heroes as they can to search for Batman, both to try to help him and because they're worried that what Kendra said is true and he may unwittingly be the catalyst for causing Barbados' invasion into their world. This is not helped by bat symbols apparently just lighting up in spots of hidden metal across the planet. This is the downside to having so much brand recognition. Batman being Batman, he's been able to send false signals of himself across the world to try to keep the League off his back. Cyborg, Wonder Woman, and Green Lantern think they found him in the Amazon, wherein his son Damien is driving a big battle wagon through it, alongside half a dozen people all dressed like Batman. Batman's become so popular and has so many books about him in the universe that he needs to franchise himself out. Pull over now, Robin. There's no winning here. Listen, lady, I'm 13 years old and driving a bat hog through the Amazon on a Tuesday morning. I am already winning. Now, if this had been Wednesday, you might have had a point. With the Flash's help, they quickly capture all the fake Batman, which is made up of all the members of the Bat family. Of course, this being Batman, even this was bait, taking a plant exfoliant in their bags and exposing it to the air. 
which summons a very angry Swamp Thing to attack the League. Superman, however, knows Bruce's heartbeat and finds him in the big truck, taking him and telling him that he needs their help and to not do this alone. Batman says he's the only one who can stop Barbados, that he's been targeted by it since after he was killed in Final Crisis and sent back in time to cave- Wait, 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 wait. Again, continuity wonkiness here. Final Crisis still happened in the New 52's history? Hawkman and Hawkgirl were around during Final Crisis 2, you know! If you're going to do a reboot, can you please just commit to it instead of making us try to figure out what did or did not happen? Anyway, Batman says that the figure with five medals thing that Kendra described, that's been happening to him. Here's where it's supposed to be a culmination of Snyder's Batman run. Various unique metals he's been exposed to in those storylines, including Electrum, Dionysium, Prometheum, and now Nth Metal. Batman doesn't know what the fifth metal is, but as soon as he's exposed to it, he'll become a cosmic counterweight. He's transported to the Dark Multiverse, Barbados will come to their universe. With whatever nightmares of mine he's pulled from the dark. Probably that one nightmare where I have to give a speech naked, and it's filmed on VHS instead of beta! Superman soon realizes that this isn't Batman either, just Clayface, who was an ally of Batman at the time. Kendra, meanwhile, heads out to meet with the other immortals that she mentioned in the backstory. They're operating out of the Legion of Doom headquarters and headed by immortal villain Vandal Savage, who says he's constructing the building for other reasons. And I will admit, while over the last few years I've begun to sour on nostalgia-baiting imagery and the like for a lot of properties, there's just always something that tickles my heart about seeing the Legion of Doom headquarters. Hey wait, wasn't that in Final Crisis 2? Why are they acting as if it's new? The Immortals have voted on a plan to stop this. Kendra's going to take an object to the Rock of Eternity and fire it at the core of the multiverse, because I Guess that's where it's located. And this particular object should destroy the Dark Multiverse in its entirety. And what object is this? The astral brain of the Anti-Monitor! Because I guess these guys just have that in a junk drawer or something! I mean, he did die again during the Mobius revelation crap, so it's not like this completely comes out of nowhere, but it's just... They need it because it's made of antimatter, and this will somehow destroy the dark matter for reasons I am unclear on, but yeah, this is just... weird. Ra's al Ghul suggests that they should still be searching for Batman, since it's likely Batman is trying to find some way of fighting this himself. And Kendra realizes that he might have gone back to the tomb of Prince Khufu, the original Egyptian ruler who would be reincarnated as Carter Hall. And indeed, we see that he's now there, Daniel apparently having come along for moral support. I can feel you there, Dream. Please, tell me my plan is the right one. I cannot speak to your plan, Batman. I've done what I can for you in this realm. If the Nightmare Army succeeds, if the world goes dark, call to me in the place of the Black Sun. I wish you luck. And then he's gone. I just want to tell you both good luck. We're all counting on you. You'll make another appearance later, but otherwise, yeah, this felt kind of pointless. I think the justification here for his presence is from the descriptions of the Dark Multiverse, wherein it's supposed to be made of, like, people's fears and nightmares. Which I think they do mean literally here, which is... ridiculous. Why is an aspect of this cosmology based on the idea of thought becoming reality when that's not how it works anywhere else? Again, I'd buy this if they were in, like, a fantasy realm, where magic and supernatural things are more common or present, more abstract realms not grounded in the real world. But this is the multiverse, which is supposed to be different parallel universes separated by different vibrational frequencies. That's it! When did we decide, oh, and it's also held together by people having bad Bad dreams. Anyway, Superman and Wonder Woman have caught up to Batman, and we learn what his plan is as he pulls out of his bag a baby Darkseid. Yeah, Darkseid was a baby for a while, and that's not even in the top ten of insane things happening in this story. Let's move on. And here's Batman's plan. 
During Final Crisis, Darkseid's power sent him back in time. It was at that point where Barbados somehow noticed him and set in motion this plan to get to the DC Universe. Barbados had made an attempt to invade it before, but Hawkman's Nth Metal Mace had actually managed to beat him back down. As such, Batman is now armed with Nth Metal and plans to use Darkseid to travel back in time and do it again. However, Wendy points out that the only reason he was able to come back to the present was because Barbados let him go back, as part of this whole scheme for Batman to become the gateway and all. So this is a one-way trip. So the plan is to have baby Darkseid shoot him with the Omega effect to send him back in time to fight an evil dark god. Magnificent bastard, I read your book! Batman tells them to take care of his family for him, but then Kendra gets in contact and warns them that Batman has fallen into a trap. This is not the tomb of Khufu. She destroyed the tomb long ago. This is the tomb of Hath Set, Hawkman's mortal enemy, and a servant of Barbados. Superman and Wonder Woman get knocked down, Batman getting a bunch of metal spikes shoved into him as Barbados' servants come out to complete the ritual. What's more, it seems the previously mentioned Court of Owls is in on this too. Well, I say that, but the way they talk seems to imply that this might be a splinter group of the court, which makes a lot more sense since otherwise there's no hinting of any of this during the original storyline where they premiered. And the fifth medal? Well, people assume the revelation here occurred in Dark Knight's Metal, but it actually premiered much earlier in the pages of Batman, during the time that Jim Gordon was running around in a robot suit as Batman. Have I ever mentioned that comic books are weird? During that time, another company built a super collider underneath Gotham and created the fifth metal, and in honor of Gotham's hero, they named it... Batmanium. Bat... Manium! Batmanium! I can't tell if that's stupid or amazing, and I kind of love it for that. Batman is covered in the stuff, and yeah, the cosmic effect on him is kind of neat. My god, it's full of stars. And he teleports away, the doorway opening for Barbados to come through. Unfortunately for the Court of Owls, what emerges out are little goblin versions of Robin that keep yelling crow as they start feasting on them. Much of their confusion because they were promised power. Wait a second. Are you saying that the evil dark god of evil who springs forth from nightmares might be... UNTRUSTWORTHY?! My god. Bruce, where is he? You want Bruce Wayne? Look around. Look around you. And thus is revealed the servants of Barbados various versions of Batman who resemble the Justice League. Barbados, who's the bigger robed Batman back there, shoots out energy beams at the two that start withering them away, ending issue two. We begin the next part with Bruce, Clark, and Diana seeming to be in Smallville as they watch Damian Wayne and Superman's son John playing guitars. Specifically, they're playing the Adam West Batman theme. Which, by the way, you should look some metal covers up on YouTube that people have made of it, because it was already a classic, but it's legitimately awesome played on an electric guitar. The group seems to think that this is after they've defeated Barbados. But then a claw comes out of Bruce's chest and grabs Clark. I knew it! I knew this was a nightmare! How else could I be happy about my son playing rock and roll? Barbado says he's doing this to screw with them, show them that it doesn't matter. In the end, all roads lead back to darkness. Fortunately, Wonder Woman still has the lasso of truth on her, so she's able to use it to pull Clark free of the vision. It seems Barbados has kept them locked up in some kind of vision, experiencing months and years worth of scenarios where they spend their whole lives fighting Barbados and ultimately failing time and again. And they're not the only two, since apparently people have suddenly become, like, skeletons or something, all attached to a big tower in Metropolis where this is happening. Wendy says they've only been out of action for seven days, but it's been enough time for Barbados to do a number on the planet. John is safe, but a good chunk of Metropolis' citizens, including Lois and Jimmy Olsen, have been changed into versions of Doomsday. Pissed, Superman flies off to Gotham to try to confront Barbados, who is protected by Joker-headed dragon things. He taunts Clark as he had in the vision, that all roads lead back to the dark. Soups is knocked down into Crime Alley, where this skinny Batman has gathered the other evil Batman. Soups tries to say that if he's Bruce Wayne, then there's still good in him. Clark, that's exactly what you said to me on my world. 
Right before I killed you and your whole family. You said it afterwards, too. I think you might have been an idiot in my universe. See, down in our realm, worlds are created by all you people up here. You fear or hope for something, and it births a world. They tell us where your Bruce's great fears come to life. That right here is the real problem with the dark multiverse concept. Even accounting for the idea that it's supposed to be born from the fears and nightmares of people thing, this is kind of lame. The Dark Multiverse, as they described it earlier, should be some kind of weird, hellish Lovecraftian realm, full of terrors we can't begin to comprehend. Some Junji Ito level of freaky-deaky, surreal, inexplicable visual horrors, uncanny valley haunting images that might not even fit with the artistic style of the rest of the comic. And instead, in practice, it's just, what if Batman, but he's mean and has someone else's superpowers? So, the Dark Multiverse is just... Parallel Universes, but with more bad guys. That's it! Functionally, the Dark Multiverse is no different than a mirror universe where everyone is evil and has a goatee. Except in this case, it's Batman, but a Cenobite from Hellraiser. And yes, for those who've been waiting, this is the Batman Who Laughs, the breakout villain of metal. Not much is actually done with him in the main miniseries itself, pushed instead to tie-ins. And unfortunately, he's also an example of DC taking a popular character and running them into the ground so that the audience is sick of him, especially by the time the sequel event came out and he plays an even bigger role. I honestly never cared for him to begin with because it's just Batman, but evil! I don't find him or his concept compelling or that unique. You can find a dozen characters with that premise already, and the continual attitude at DC to give villains so much spotlight, or even their own books, is just a massive letdown. People kept describing Dark Knight's metal to me as edgy, or at least a parody of edginess and 90s grimdark aesthetic, but, like, it's not. I wouldn't call any of this edgy, or even parody edgy. This came out in 2017 and 2018. Nobody's doing 90s-style edgelord anymore, where it's heroes having guns and pouches and blades and black leather. Dude, they really should, though! Edgelord these days is about tastelessness in regards to real-world topics. Sexual assault, abortion, mental health, war, body horror, that sort of thing. The kind of things you can find in any given Mark Miller comic. No one's sticking spikes on superheroes to try to be edgy. They're making Superman parodies where he's a cannibal or something. And it's not even critiquing it or anything, it's just, hey, these are villains because we put them in evil dark versions of their outfits. Anyway, more of this douchebag. The thing is, each of us has killed you, all of you, on our worlds. We cross the lines he's scared to, which actually begs the questions, are we really his fears or are we his desires? Food for thought. Not really. I somehow doubt Bruce has a big desire to have a bunch of insane feral children dress up like Robins, put them in chains, and have them rip people to shreds. Maybe Aspar Batman. Soups is soon rescued by the Flash and Dr. Fate. He's brought to the Oblivion Bar, a magical pocket dimension owned by Nightmaster and Detective Chimp, both former members of a group called the Shadow Pact, that sadly never really went anywhere after they were introduced in the build-up to Infinite Crisis. Point is, things are grim. It's only been a few days, but the remaining heroes are not doing so great. Nightwing is there and explains their continual failures to stop the alternate Batman, referred to as the Dark Knights. Again, why is it not spelled like that in the title? As they've taken city after city under their control, setting up towers with people attached to them like we saw in Metropolis. The towers are conductors of dark energy, and their plan is to sink the Earth into the Dark Multiverse. What's more, even this effort to grab soups was not without cost. They'll be able to trace them back to the Oblivion Bar soon. Kendra thinks they're utterly boned since nothing hurts them, but Green Arrow and Robin show up with an arrowhead of Nth Metal, revealing that indeed Nth Metal actually does harm them. So Kendra's efforts to destroy it all was a bad thing. The remaining Nth Metal can be found in a few objects, like Dr. Fate's helmet, Steel's hammer, and inside Plastic Man who is currently a giant egg. Yeah, this one's not a reference to another comic, other than to The Dark Knight Strikes Again, weirdly enough, but rather, this is how they're reintroducing Plastic Man into the New 52 timeline. Your guess is as good as mine.
The egg is vibrating, giving them coordinates for locations where they can go to find more nth metal. Deep space, beneath Atlantis, and in the Rock of Eternity. The last location, though, points to the dark multiverse itself. Clark thinks that that's Batman, who may have been trying to reach out to them via a code that he, Diana, and Clark had worked out years before. The group decides to split up to pursue the leads, a Superman giving a speech about hope that it's exactly what they need to combat Barbados, even Deathstroke coming in to join because of reasons. Dr. Fate teleports everyone to their respective destinations. Fate, Kendra, and Wonder Woman going for the Rock of Eternity, Green Lantern, Mr. Terrific, and the Plastic Man Egg heading to Thanagar, Aquaman and Deathstroke to Atlantis, and finally, Super Superman, Steel, and Flash heading to the Fortress of Solitude. Why there? Because stored there, and the vibrational reference thing from the build-up to this that I mentioned, is one of the dimensional tuning forks from Crisis on Infinite Earths. What the? Superman, tell me that's not the antenna the anti-monitor used to- Okay, this one I'm 99% certain was just a flub that the editor didn't catch. It was the monitor who had the dimensional tuning forks to try to protect Earth, not the anti-monitor. Although that once again calls into question, do they remember the crisis now too? I did quickly check through Dark Side War, where the whole anti-monitor is Mobius thing happened, and there was a tuning fork he was working on, so it could be that one, but it wasn't otherwise referenced or acknowledged by the heroes. I don't know if they ever even saw it. Anyway, Superman plans to use the tower, in conjunction with the Phantom Zone, which is apparently located close to the Dark Multiverse, as a method of traveling there to try to rescue Batman. If we open a portal with the Phantom Zone projector, while we supercharge the antenna with the Speed Force, Steel's connection to the Nth Metal might create an energy link to the Dark Multiverse. Using multimodal reflection sorting. Superman thinks that they plan to use Batman as some kind of battery that'll enable them to sink the Earth into the Dark Multiverse. And since their Earth is kind of the central pillar in the multiverse, it'll bring down everything else with them. Unfortunately, when he arrives, we discover that this was a trap. Dark, decaying versions of Superman grab him and plug him into the tower next to Batman, who's also noticeably aged and withered. He said the code he sent them was actually in reverse, an indication to not come. Well, how the hell was he supposed to figure that out, Bruce? He wouldn't have even tried to make the trip if you hadn't called out to him! Oh, and because people will ask why I didn't mention it, the code is a convoluted way of putting in DC. Maybe if there wasn't a billion other things happening in this comic, it'd be a thing I dwelled on, but... No, I didn't even notice that the first time I read it. Anyway, point is that Superman is actually the real battery for charging this whole draining them into the dark multiverse thing, leading us to issue four. Once upon a time, there was a library full of stories that would never be told. So many Smokey and the Bandit sequels. Impossible stories destined only to happen in dream or in nightmare. So many stories with Amityville slapped onto the title that had nothing to do with the Amityville horror. Should any of these stories be spoken, let alone actually occur, the whole library will burn. But that's okay, because we have insurance. And the world will likely burn with it. So climate change is because of a library burning? This is why we need more library funding, people! A bunch of alternate dark multiverse supermen show up to take Batman away since he's fulfilled his purpose, but one of them is a superman who killed Batman and took over for him, for some reason, and thus is wearing a gauntlet that can shoot various kryptonite beams. Bruce steals it and puts it on, forcing the evil superman away while he recovers the real superman. However, because the evil superman can still probably take him in his weakened state, he recalls Daniel's words to him and summons him for help. Meanwhile, Diana's team busts into the Rock of Eternity, where they suspect that the nth metal there is Hawkman's mace. In Atlantis, Aquaman and Deathstroke reach the tomb of Atlantis's first king, Arian, and bust into the tomb, discovering a passageway down in some dark depths. And on Thanagar, Green Lantern and Mr. Terrific, along with the Plastic Man Egg, are brought to see their leader. It feels like part of a story I'm not supposed to understand. Yeah, that's a common feeling to have with this comic, Hal. They meet the leader, Anamar Sin, who already knows about their quest for the Nth Metal, and he reports that he has consumed all of it into himself. He's also taken over the Empire recently with the help of Starro the Conqueror. But I killed me? I psyched you out, sucker, and regrew myself from a piece of my own exploded tentaclaw. See issue. Um, Scott? Greg, when did this happen? And the response is them making the devil horns. 
You know, something that people have told me about this comic is that it's not really meant to be something you think too hard about. It's just intended to be a fun, wild ride, and I shouldn't worry about stuff like the continuity. Then why does it keep referencing past continuity from as far back as ten years prior to it? The story can't have it both ways. Either the continuity is important and plays an important role in this, or it's just a fun, goofy story where we don't have to worry about anything too important. As with other stories, I'm willing to meet it halfway, but then going out of your way to shrug at it with that narration box, I don't think anyone would really care if they didn't have it at all. And it makes it seem like this whole thing is a waste of my time. Because as a comics fan, I do care about the continuity. I do care about making sense of it all. I've said it before, I'm in the minority of fans who likes that these characters don't have a definitive ending. I like that it goes on and on and on, and there's new chapters, new adventures, new hardships, etc. Continuity does not have to be a hindrance unless you make it one. It's why I keep going back to look and see what the hell it is they're talking about, or pointing out when what they're saying doesn't make sense. And they can't say that the story isn't meant to have far-lasting continuity stuff either, because the after-effects of the story ended up creating a lot of changed status quos for other books. It eventually led to a sequel that shook up the continuity AGAIN! Anyway, Sin says that they already have a plan to deal with Barbados. The Thanagarians have known about the Dark Multiverse for eons now, and have constructed a big-ass cannon aimed right at Earth's core that will end the threat once and for all. However, he has some new plans now thanks to them bringing the Plastic Man egg to them. With Starro's psychic powers suppressing Hal Jordan's ability to use his ring, our heroes are captured. Back with Superman and Batman, Daniel has rescued them. Do you realize how long I've been trapped here? You did nothing to stop any of this from happening! Why help now?! He's got a point. If this situation is bad enough that one of the Endless is involved at all, it feels like he should have done something more than act as a taxi service. Daniel simply says this story is far more personal than they can understand. He brings them to Lucian's library in the Dreaming, where there's a section full of stories that should never be told, made from the horrors of the human heart. Barbados is somehow causing those stories to become reality, and thus the entire library has begun to burn. Should this continue, all of the Dreaming will be consumed, and with it, all stories forever. Oh, I see. Actually, no, I don't. Let's ignore this and move on. Daniel, for some reason, can't actively stand beside them, but instead gives them a story. The big retcon I've been talking about a bit. In the beginning of the universe, there was matter and antimatter, with the monitor and the anti-monitor. But what was previously unrevealed was a third figure, the World Forger, who resided in the dark multiverse and created universes from the hopes and fears of all living beings. The universes that were stable became part of the proper multiverse. Those that were twisted and unstable were destroyed by Barbados, a dragon that served the World Forger. At some point, Barbados killed the World Forger and allowed the twisted worlds to live on longer than they should, though they are still unstable and going to dissolve, hence why the evil versions of them are doing this at all. If they don't leave the Dark Multiverse, they'll all die off. And I know that I said in the Zero Hour review that I liked it in spite of its flaws because of the characters just trying to fight for their own existence. Yeah, that doesn't apply here. These guys are assholes and can burn in hell for all I care. Daniel says that the nth metal they need, the name actually being a shorthand for ninth metal, and that's actually not a retcon from this book, but referencing its Golden Age origins, is not going to be enough to stop Barbados. They need the metal from the World Forge, which is considered the tenth metal and far more powerful. He says he can create a passage for them to travel to the World Forge, but they need to walk with hope and wonder in their hearts for it to work. And Bruce says that's not possible for him anymore. He spent decades from his perspective down here, showing him not only the destruction of his hope, but all his failures and mistakes he's made to get here. Fortunately, this is why he got Superman with you, who's all about inspiring that, and gets Bruce to remind himself that he has hope and wonder in not only his own son, but the rest of the Bat family. It's a good moment, but I think narratively it should have come at a different point. This idea of his despair is introduced on this page, and then ended on the same page, too. At the Rock of Eternity, they can't find the mace, 
But Kendra has found the rock that apparently acts as the center of the multiverse. And as per the instructions of the Immortals, she plans to toss the astral brain of the Anti-Monitor into it. Which is literally a brain in her hands. Dr. Fate mentions the brain has been compressed, but... Like, that's a hell of a compression considering how freaking huge the Anti-Monitor is! Also, the entire point of this is that the brain is made of antimatter. But then Kendra and the edge of the area she sets it down on are made of matter, so shouldn't there have been a kaboom already? Anyway, Wendy and Dr. Fate try to tell her to stop, since this could end up destroying the actual multiverse and not just the Dark One. But then suddenly Kendra seems to give in to despair or something, and is taken over by Barbados, transforming her into this new form. Black Adam shows up and zaps Dr. Fate, revealing that he and Vandal Savage have made their own deal with Barbados, joining his side. In the Dark Multiverse, Superman and Batman arrive at the Forge of Worlds, but it's already been corrupted by Barbados. Batman says that according to Carter Hall's journal, this place is supposed to be all about creation and beginnings. It is now protected by the new dragon and keeper of the Dark Forge, Carter Hall, now transformed into this giant form to end issue four. I am Carter Hall, dragon of Barbados, keeper of the Dark Forge. There are only endings here. Well. This is bad news. In Gotham City, Barbados laments that with Superman out of the battery, the Earth has stopped sinking. The Batman who laughs, however, says there's nothing to worry about. But your voice, it's the dark chord that will shake the strings of the multiverse. Anti-music to bring the hordes of the dark here. Begin the Maroon 5 playlist! Whatever the noise is that's playing, it's reaching into the dark multiverse and affecting Superman, making him start to despair. Carter starts attacking them as weird quasi-illusions show up to try screwing with the two, like Batman's villains coming out to taunt him. Bats! The bad news, Wah! Is Harvey sawed your kids in half! No! No! I won't fall for it this time! You keep playing that joke on me, Penguin! It's not funny anymore! The good news? You have twice as many now. Well, it's a good thing that I'm rich and can afford that! Back with Aquaman and Deathstroke, the passageway was actually a portal that teleports the two into the center of the Earth. And the two aren't immediately crushed into powder by the enormous pressure at this level, because this is a fish man and an assassin with super soldier juice running through him. Obvious, really. They discover some kind of ancient technology at the core, which seems to be a hybrid of Atlantean and some other force. Look, I can sense nth metal in that orb. Can you operate this thing? Also, I can sense nth metal now, because shut up. Back on Thanagar, Mr. Terrific explains what the deal is with the Plastic Man egg. His origin story involved him falling into a vat of chemicals, but in this revised version, those chemicals were mixed with cosmic metals. As such, Plastic Man's body is a superconductor for cosmic energies, including the kind used by the Dark Multiverse. The nightmares of every living thing have been running through his head and trying to turn him evil. When he finally couldn't take them anymore, he retracted himself into the egg form to fight off all the dark impulses. Fortunately, the two have some help that comes to free them. The Martian Manhunter, who has been hidden here for a while, and can block Starro's telepathy to allow Hal to use his ring again. While Wonder Woman has to single-handedly fight off both Black Adam and Kendra, Batman manages to get through a bit to Carter Hall by reminding him of words he wrote in his journal, creating a spark inside the forge. Wendy finally manages to find Hawkman's mace and uses it to knock out Black Adam, but she's blindsided by the Batman who laughs with a machine gun filled with eighth metal bullets. Hello, Diana. How are you? Me, I've done a lot of traveling lately. Had the pleasure of visiting many, many worlds and killing them. Admittedly, it kind of makes the frequent flyer miles pointless, but still. Aquaman and Deathstroke retrieve the Nth Metal, only to be attacked by Black Manta, who also struck a deal with Barbados and is now fighting alongside some of the Dark Knights. On Thanagar, they've already dealt with Starro, probably in a tie-in, and they retrieve Plastic Man. They want to try to use the big cannon to activate the Nth Metal in the Earth's core, but they discover that it's been tampered with by more of the Dark Knights, who arrive to confront them. The Batman Who Laughs explains that this was the backup plan after Superman was freed. The heroes gathered all the remaining Nth Metal right into their hands. 
The cannon will instead be used to darken the Earth's core and finally sink it, and the World Forge is still forever dark, and Batman and Superman will fail to retrieve the metal there. Fortunately, as the Batman Who Laughs pointed out, Diana will never give up, so she hits Kendra with the Lasso of Truth to help free her from Barbados' control, and the two leap into the multiverse's core into the Dark Multiverse right into the waiting army of dark alternate versions of all the other heroes, including a lot of alternate Wonder Women. Do something for me. What? Yell. Yell? Yeah, my throat's kind of sore from the battle, so I need someone else to scream in terror for me. As we do this, yell so loud, Barbados and the laughing Batman's ears burst. So loud, they understand. It's not a scream. It's never a scream. What is it then, Diana? It's a war cry. It's times like this that I wish I could use more copyrighted music like in past event comics months. If any moment called for sacred worlds, it's this. And thus we reach the end with issue six. While the various leaguers get dragged away from their missions into the dark multiverse, the fight there with Wonder Woman has been going on for hours. She's been trying to bang her bracelets together to summon the others, but it hasn't been working. Until Kendra suggests using the mace on them. Your bracelets are eighth metal. The mace is ninth. And she does this, which somehow teleports the leaguers right to her. This makes no sense, and yet it's working. However it works, it rejuvenates them, and Mr. Terrific tells Plastic Man it's time to finally get out of the egg and help for a bit. And it works! Plastic Man getting big enough to clear a path for the heroes before having to retreat into an egg again. Kendra sends Wendy deeper into the dark, telling her that she's the only one who can rescue Superman and Batman. That she shows people the truth. That they are loved and worth it. From the beginning, Barbados has separated us, made us feel alone, helpless. But you call the formations. You never gave up on Superman, Batman, Carter, or me. You bind us. Pants to be brightened. The forge has gone dark again as Carter Hall appears, but Kendra, connected to 1D via the Lasso of Truth, spots him and gets him to start remembering who he is. Barbados tries to get him to play ball, but then the cavalry arrives. Cyborg, the Flash, and a bunch of Batman from the multiverse. Also, Detective Chimp. And Pirate Chimp. And, uh, eh, I don't know. It should be a cool moment, but it feels like they only wanted to reference the really popular Batman Elseworld stories. So it's only like four of them, and this shot isn't as impressive as it should be. Points for the chimps, though. Wendy dives into the forge to try to get Clark and Bruce as Kendra gets through to Carter. The forge reignites, though Barbados is unconcerned. We are in my realm, where all ends in darkness. I will create worlds to torture them for eternity. Who is truly foolish enough to believe they can win down here in the darkness? You know, smart guy with a flashlight? No, of course the answer comes from Wonder Woman, Batman, and Superman. Now all decked out in glowing 10th metal armor. Also, little known fact about metal, it cures old. Batman commandeers one of the Joker-faced dragons and rides it out to Green Lantern and Aquaman, giving them some of the 10th metal armor too. They say the 8th metal is the stuff of gods. The 9th uses dark energy to give its carrier powers that defy physics. But the 10th, also called Element X, is a metal of the so-called Forge itself. The metal of pure possibility. They say whoever wields it, let his first words be recorded forever in the halls of kings. I'm not wearing hockey pads! For his metal can take the shape of whatever is needed. Now, tenth metal, in the form of... Anti-Barbados Bat Spray! Wendy puts out a call for any remaining heroes to converge on Challenger's Mountain. Said heroes freeing the people who were trapped in the tower, including other superheroes. Hawkman comes to help too, attacking Barbados. Realizing that things have gone badly, he contacts the Batman who laughs to enact their backup plan. He's in a cave undoing bandages that were covering... the monitor. Oh, okay, it's just the original monitor. What? 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 
I know it's a lot for you. After all, you've only just started to reform after the last multiversal crisis. How do they even remember who the Monitor is? And why are they calling him the Over Monitor instead of just the Monitor? And what about the 52 other ones? How did he only just start to reform? He can reform? Since when? The Anti-Monitor came back to life twice since the original crisis. Where the hell has he been? It just raises too many questions. The Batman Who Laughs explains that by utilizing positive matter from him and antimatter from the anti-monitor's brain, they'll utterly annihilate the multiverse, leaving only the dark multiverse. And at some point, Batman figured out where he was and shows up to confront him. Wherever they are nullifies the 10th metal armor. Take a good look, Bruce. What do you see? You've never fought someone with all your training, all your discipline. See it yet? I'm not him in a bat suit. I'm you. The Batman who won't shut the hell up is a better name for this guy, frankly. The problem with the character is very much the same problem I have with Snyder's Joker. It's again, not the worst thing ever. It's just an alternate character interpretation, but it's one I don't like. Snyder's Joker monologues. A lot. But he doesn't tell jokes. He just rambles incessantly. There's nothing about either the Batman who laughs or Snyder's Joker that shows why the Joker is such an endearing character. They're so focused on the murderous genius that they forget he's supposed to be a clown. They forget to have him be a comedian. All either does is talk and talk and talk. Make a face, drop your pants, something. He's able to stab Bruce and then gets ready to kill him with a gun, rambling the whole time about how he's the apex predator by having no ethical codes to live by. But that's when Batman reveals that he brought some help. The Joker. Ha! The Batman who talks is more like it. See? Even he agrees with me. If there is one interesting aspect of this book that does bookend Snyder's Batman run from the start to metal, it's this moment right here. In the first issue of the New 52 run, Batman seems to team up with the Joker and Arkham to take down the rest of the inmates. It was just Dick Grayson in disguise, but now we get to this moment where he legitimately does team up with the Joker to take down the Batman who laughs. As they start kicking his ass, the other heroes are equally succeeding in taking down the other Dark Knights. Barbados gets ready to kill Hawkman, but Kendra swoops in with a 10th metal gauntlet to fly right through him to stop him. While Joker stays behind to fight the Batman who laughs, Bruce gets the monitor away back to the others. Barbados won't stay dead for long, and they need a way to separate the Earth from the Dark Multiverse again. With the monitor now here, he explains that their armor is so powerful that it can act as a conduit to raise the Earth back. But they'll need to reach out to everyone they can to form a connection. And this is where we try to connect back to the Megazord stuff at the start. In true proper super hero comic book goofiness, they use the armor to unite themselves with the people of Earth and bring it back into the proper universe. They reached out with a message of fortitude and solidarity, but above all, of bravery, of daring, and in reaching out, they ignited a spark. Unfortunately, the Batman who laughs left a lot of gasoline around, so... And after some more optimistic narration from Carter Hall, it turns out they actually went a little farther than they were supposed to. Somehow, they end up shattering the Source Wall, that barrier around the universe, and the effects of that will be felt for a while after this story. In the epilogue, the Justice League gather for dinner at Wayne Manor for the wrap-up. The power of the armor was able to make them wish up a reversal of all the damage Barbados caused, and Challenger's Mountain was restored to its rightful place. Barbados is chained up by the Monitor in the deepest part of the Dark Multiverse, the World Forge reignited and doing its job again. Bruce thanks everyone for their help in all this, keeping him from giving in to despair. But there are, of course, the after effects. Carter Hall is alive again, but in his time in the Dark Multiverse, he saw flashes of things to come. New beings to emerge in light of the Source Wall's fracture. A book is now missing from the dreaming, various other things that will come to pass and cause issues. To combat the potential new threats, they're expanding the Justice League and preparing for whatever tomorrow brings. In the meantime, party! Including Damien and John indeed rocking out. My god, the nightmare becomes reality! And so our event ends with Bruce telling Clark and Diana that he's not worried about what's to come, because he has a plan. Revealing blueprints for the Hall of Justice, which was already a thing in the New 52 thanks to the Justice League International comic that I actually felt was better than the main Justice League book at the time. This comic does not suck. 
It is hopeful, exciting, heroic, action-packed, full of heroes stopping bad guys and showing off the best qualities of the greatest heroes of the DC Universe. But it is also a confusing, fast-paced, exposition-bloated story that simultaneously asks you to not think about it, while in turn making you scratch your head because you didn't think about it. Of all the events we've looked at over the last several weeks, this is the one I had the most frustrating time getting started. I think a lot of it had to do with just a general pessimism and cynicism that carried over from three events that exemplified the worst of what event comics had to offer. Endless tie-ins to feed a greedy machine, editorial mandates ruining good ideas, a lack of substance, characters making moronic decisions to service a dumb plot, and just a general feeling like we're wasting our time. So walking into Dark Knight's metal which unabashedly loves big stories involving world-ending threats and trying to build on what came before, ending on an optimistic note, and hell, no heroes dying, which is not something that can be said for any of the other three events, and like my favorite comic of all time, we technically have negative one deaths with Hawkman's return, maybe negative two for the Monitor as well. It just felt a bit overwhelming, not helped by being constantly reminded of the confusion I had when it first came out and my frustration with the industry during the time I stopped reading. Dark Knight's Metal is by no means a perfect story in the slightest. This is not a story for people just trying to get into comics. Then again, few events are. There is plenty I could still question, still overanalyze, still try to wrap my brain around why any of it happened. It's too damn fast, feeling like we condemn a 9-12 to 12 issue story into only 6. I do not hate it though, and I understand why so many love it, but this is not a favorite of mine. It's just... a lot. But compared to the other three events we covered for Event Comics Month 4, it is certainly refreshing to just see something that goes for grandiosity and delivers on it. Even if you needed a fan wiki on hand to try to figure out what the hell some of the stuff is that they refer to that has to do with anything. But it still all comes together in the end, and it works, delivering a tale of light and hope winning out over despair. And quite frankly, after so many delays, so many long episodes, I need a break. I'm taking the rest of April off from atop the fourth wall, working on restoring some history of Power Rangers to YouTube, and we'll be back in May for another cosmic journey with the Star Wars number seven. And lest anyone think I forgot to mention this, DC actually produced a rock album of a few songs to go along with the story. I listened to it, I think it's pretty good, though I'm no expert and heavy metal isn't usually my thing. War Cry was pretty damn good though. Hello my friends, please take a moment to like this video, subscribe to the channel, and click the bell for notifications on new video releases. If you'd like to support future videos, you can check out my Patreon or purchase a t-shirt via Teespring or Shark Robot. Thanks for watching!